be doing today, again, is a couple things. Once again, this is the last session for the course called Bigfoot Salt. How are you doing, sir? Bigfoot Salt, Hybrid Hominid. This is a series of courses that are two hours long each. This is the fifth course. This will be the capstone lecture that will bring all of my archaeological and zooarchaeological research together in one place. We're going to discuss this afterwards, and then we're going to take questions on the information I presented to the regular students over the last nine weeks, eight weeks. And then we're going to vote on it, because theoretically what we're doing today is we're involved in a simulated court of inquiry, scientific court of inquiry. And we've been examining evidence over the last eight weeks in all of the different categories to determine if it's a hoax, if it's a myth, and if not, what is it? And more than that, we'll make a scientific classification today. Any questions before we get started? All right. Once again, prove it. I always say that. Anytime somebody says, I have Bigfoot evidence, first thing out of your mouth should be saying, prove it. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've spent a significant amount of time in the woods. Don't do a lot of hunting these days. However, I used to with my family. Uh, some of the research conferences that I've spoken to related to this research are 69th Anthropological Research Conference and the Sasquatch Summit, International Bigfoot Conferences, etc., etc., as well as having designed and taught the first four college level Bigfoot classes ever that I'm aware of. Um, and uh, thank you for Centralia College for doing that. We also taught uh, one of the same classes at Lower Columbia College, CSI Bigfoot. And that's where I met some of my research partners down there. And we were able to find a significant amount of information, including the bones that they were brought with us today. So we have the information from the examiners you are to proof. In person for you today. Uh, I spent a little time in the military, did my last tour attached to Green Berets, um, university education. Also, Here's my Native American history. And I like to stack my stuff up on stage. That's the difference between stories and science and facts. It's my Native American history, Cherokee history, Eastern and Western nation from 1786 to today, chief to chief, both nations. Here is my um, appointment documents from the President of the United States to the Resource Advisory Committee for the North Gipper Inche Forest, which includes Mount St. Helens, through the Secretary of Agriculture of the previous administration, Tom Bilsack, which would be President Obama, as the archaeological and historical representative for this region. That's what enables me to do my research on Mount St. Helens. All right, moving forward. Is there any questions about my background before we move forward? Okay. Some of you have already seen this. It's a review for some of you have. These are the four classes that we designed and taught at Centralia and Lower Columbia College starting in 2014 when I found the first series of bones around Ryan Lake at Mount St. Helens. Then um, Mr. Mills and his father found two more stacks on the other side of Mount St. Helens around the Lewis Riverside. And we were able to uh, mathematically and geometrically link these two, these three sites together through scientific analysis and research, which formed the basis of these two courses here, 2015 and 2017. We initially examined all the material through Dr. Meldrum and some of the other scientists and evolved on from the giant ape theory onto a number of other theories, and we'll discuss that today. Those are part of our three origination theories that we'll discuss in conclusion today. Some of the conferences, some of our friends here, Dr. Meldrum, Cliff Rackham from Finding Bigfoot, uh, David Pilates, I'm not sure if a lot of you are familiar with him, has a book called The 411 Series about people that are missing in the national parks and forests. Very interesting, provocative series of books. This is the book that I authored related to the culmination of all these scientific papers and the research related to zooarchaeology or forensic dental impression research, very simply, bite marks on bones, okay? 
So, let's talk a little bit about what exactly is the scientific method. When you go into the forest, or anywhere else, you have an idea. It's important to understand we've got structures for looking at data. We're looking at ideas, right? It's important to understand that there's specific and classical structures called the scientific method for looking at and interpreting new information and new ideas, right? So what we do is more of a cyclical process, all right? You have a hypothesis, an idea. Okay, in this case, if Bigfoot is a hoax, you're not going to see any physical evidence. If it's real, it's going to leave evidence, okay? Hypothesis, idea. All right? Then we look at if it's going to leave information, where is it going to be leaving it at? And what types of information? What types of data? If it's real, it has to eat, it has to reproduce, it has to communicate, right? It has to excrete, leave waste products. It's going to leave DNA, right? It's going to have sightings, or it's a myth, it's a hoax, and it's not. We're going to look for information based on our idea to predict a location or an observation, and then we're going to go to the field and institute our process, right? We're going to go implement our theory. In this case, if Bigfoot is real or a corporal creature, it will leave tracks. The three origination theories are great ape, hybrid hominid, and relic hominid, hominid, hominid order. If it's going to be, if it's a great ape, it's going to consider great ape features and behaviors. If it's a relic hominid or hybrid hominid, it's going to show and exhibit hominid morphological structures and behaviors and maybe a combination of both because the hybrid hominid theory encompasses the other two as well it's an overarching umbrella theory so what we're going to look at is behavior and information in our case because we believe it was hybrid hominid so we're looking for that type of signature data First thing we did is I recontacted some of my friends from the Green Berets teaching school called um, the Keepers. And they actually are still instructing there to this day. And what they do is an enemy capabilities assessment. Whenever you have a new battlefield, they do an assessment on the capabilities and technologies of that adversary. In this case, I gave my colleagues, of which I showed you pictures of previously, who are still teaching there, the capabilities that I have found related to this creature. Then they drafted an assessment, it's called a speak guide assessment, to put me in the right place at the right time with the understanding of this creature's activities, its capabilities, and its limitations. Okay? We all have limitations. We call that science. Technology, tactics, and training, STT. Then you implement it in the field. Very simple. Research strategy. In this case, we use a special operation military strategy because we felt that the academics had failed, the trackers had failed, and we needed a new type of way. All right? Why reinvent the wheel? It's not working. Do something different. So, how do we go about proving something scientifically? This is important because people always say, you'll never prove Bigfoot. It's not possible without a body. Right? I said, that's not true. We prove things all the time without having to shoot, kill one, gut one, and nail it to the barn wall. How do we do that? It's called the scientific method. It's a cyclical process of improvement. You gather data. It's a process of improving that data through a series of specific steps. All steps pre-approved by peer-reviewed scientists. In other words, if we're trying to prove something new or novel, what we need to do is first of all frame it and then prove it in the words and the structures of modern and classical academics that already peer-review and publish their own work. Or it'll never be approved, it'll never be accepted. 
as a scientific fact. So, the process is very simple. We have an assumption that something's happening without proof. In other words, there's something killing deer and elk in the forest through catastrophic blunt force trauma. It's not killing them with tools. It's not sawing them up. There's no gunshot damage, arrow damage. There's very little to any scavenger activity. We have a mystery. Then we find some bone piles, the first one. Found a few others. We conducted subject matter expert consultation with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. All right, the experts. Okay, in the Karelian Bear and Cougar Dog Program. And they assured us, and I'll show you this quote, that it was not anything from our resident and our resident ecosystems. How these bones were not only processed, but the teeth marks or dentition marks on the bones themselves. In all three locations, we had common structures, common forms of, of working these behaviors, tooth structures, and locations. Right? Now we have evidence because we have assessed it through subject matter experts above and beyond our own personal expertise, which, is, which wasn't much at this time. Now we look at how do we arrange this material in a written and oral argument to present it to a scientific body. Right? In this case, a peer-reviewed paper. Right? So the first paper we wrote that came out, it came out in 2015, over 100 pages. And it hit the scientific world like a bomb. <laughs> bomb! Because it was a whole new way of looking at this phenomenon. We weren't trying to capture pictures. We weren't trying to get a piece of hair. Right? We were looking for repeatable, microscopically impossible material that would not only identify a specific creature that was alive, but what it was, how it acted, what it ate. Right? Remember, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We're trying to solve this. So, the third paper that we submitted, second paper first, was at the 69th Anthropological Research Conference up in Tacoma. I presented the same research a week after I got out of the hospital for a cat by intensive care to a packed house. Almost passed out. I was looking pretty sad. That one was to the governmental and tribal archaeologist and anthropologist, the PhDs. Over 100 pages, again, <laughs> hit them like a ton of bricks. Because you know what they were thinking? Who let this guy in the building? Because I'm throwing this out there and have all these tracks and stuff on the floor, and I'm doing all these measurements scientifically in their language, in their house, at their conference. They were flabbergasted. We had a few questions, but not many. All right? Remember, we're putting this out there so that people can comment on it. Then you move to publication. Remember, we're moving into peer review, already published science. That's how you prove something scientifically. Once you identify it, you prepare it, then you present it, then you write it up, and you present it to a world class archaeological research. Journal of Archaeological Research Science, which accepted our request for publication. We have one version that's already been reviewed, and I'm working on it. And we're still in the peer review process. Third version of the paper, the best version, because what it did is it refined all of the data to its strongest point. Indisputable science situated in already peer-reviewed published material. Airtight. Has to be airtight. Right? That is how you prove something. Without a body. Because you don't need to shoot something. It might be the last one. We don't know. Right? Besides, I have moral issues with that. And that's why I'm putting this class on. And that's why I've done all this research, because I'm going to take you to the absolute closest possibility without shooting something. All right? In this case, we had two profiles of data. And this is important. You don't just start writing paper. 
You have to frame this scientifically, not on what you think, but based on the data that's available in the field. Right? The data drives the discovery and the theory. All the theory is what got you there in the first place. You take that off. You take those lenses off when you're looking at data. Right? We have two primary types of data in this case. Forensic dental impression data or bone marks, teeth marks on bones, and corresponding behavioral activities. Neo technology, behavioral activities. Taphonomy is bones, teeth marks and bones. Very simple. Forensic biotic taphonomy, teeth marks and bones. Bones go through a specific process. Bodies go through a specific degeneration or digenesis process after they cease to live, cease to exist. A predictable and specific process that we can chart based on environment, scavenger activity, insect activity, etc., etc. Right? Chartable processes, predictable and chartable processes. Basic forensic science. When the coroner shows up, that's what he does. Again, situated in current science, we did not invent the edges of the frame. The frame edges were already invented by somebody else. We just applied them after we searched out with the appropriate frame that was going to illuminate the types of data in those two categories. Any questions about the data frames before we move forward? Data frames, right? Can't go blind. You need some edges, right? All right, very simply. Behavior, teeth marks. Here it is. Here's the first one that I found by Ryan Light. I was hiking up to my normal fishing spot, and I happened to notice a stack and a bone field white against the green carpet of the forest floor. And I was like, that's kind of strange. So I went over there and noticed that something had stacked what I thought unnaturally piled. And if somebody could theoretically head sat there, eat on those bones, and drop them between their legs, just like we do with ribs, right? Theoretically, that's the message I got in my head. And I got to looking around, and two other skulls had been bashed in the face, ritually placed downhill. So I taped it all off the survey tape and said, hey, you know what, I'm checking on the way back down here. Well, I had some really exciting, interesting interactions that night. Came back down the hill, and documented this site and collected some of the bones that I felt had been gnawed on. They're in this box right here. Free to look at. Unnaturally, right? Remember, no fire damage, no tool damage, no arrows, no firearms, no nothing. Skulls bashed in. Catastrophic. Pinch point kill site. Proximity to water. Terrain features. Those are all observations. What is the prey animal? How were the bones laid out? What was chewed on? Was there any hair left? How many animals? Was there any scavenger activity? Was there fresh meat still on the bones? Those are all extremely important questions. And that's why you take it off and it's a crime scene. Crime scene. Crime scene number one. 2013. Crime scene number two and number three. These were close to the same area. These were a little harder to find, yet they were obviously placed there on top of that grass. This is much more interesting here for me. Some of the things that were common that we noticed was gnawing, there's a gnaw mark right there on the bones, piled placements, in other words, stacking. And I showed you other examples of that uh, with that other researcher, Nathan Rio. We saw that during the class. <coughs> I get information all the time now about bone stacks that they're finding. Bone stacking is a common in behavior. I talked to Dr. Craig Stanford from UCLA. I just got back from Tanzania, where he's looking at apes and ape behavior and chimpanzees. They don't stack bones. They kill animals and then they toss them down wherever they're at. But they don't sit and chew up an animal and stack the bones up. That's a human behavior, common in behavior. It's one of the foremost authorities on private behavior in the world right now. Dr. Craig Stanford, you sell it. They don't do this. 
So the gradient theory out the window, right there. Boom. Relic comedy of hybrid comedy. Remember, subject matter expert, Department of Fish and Wildlife says, mm, no, something else is happening here. Three different sites, similar to this, okay? Surface level commonalities, behavioral commonalities, prey commonalities, death commonalities, pinch point kill site, proximity to water, proximity to other types of vegetation, all right? All clues, disarticulation from the spinal column, critical clue, excuse me, critical clue, critical clue. The first thing we have to do is eliminate the known. We have three sites, commonalities. Are these explainable? using the current residents of the ecosystem of Mount St. Helens. Fish and Wildlife says, nope, likely tied to Homo sapiens as an illegal or a bait site. Immediately said, not bear, not cougar, not wolverine, not badger, not anything like that. Humans, Homo sapiens, period. Well, who's gonna stack all these up way out there for no particular reason, first of all? And secondly, the disarticulation strategy that you see is different than a natural disarticulation which collapses in on itself when the connected tissue starts to digenesis or degenerate and run away. Unless scavengers get at it. And they leave scavenger activity in the form of teeth marks, claw marks, and tracks. And those same scavengers can be also be charted by their teeth marks and their behaviors and their selection of specific parts of an animal that they seek nutrition. So different animals and different scavengers seek different areas of a corpse for nutritional needs. Another way we can determine what scavenger or what animal is involved in what activity besides teeth marks. Predictable. Something disarticulated the ribs unnaturally, chewed on them and stacked them up, and according to the Department of Fish and Wildlife, it was a homo sapien. Now who goes around and knocks out deer and elk with a bat and chews them up raw? And doesn't knock their teeth out? We're talking deer and elk bones here, people. You know, not noodles. All right. First thing we look for, besides teeth marks, footprints. Footprints. They were able to track it back and cast a footprint. That doesn't look like a bear footprint or a cougar. Looks like some kind of hominid footprint. Some kind. And through that analysis, they were able to determine the step and stride length, not only the print itself, but the step and stride length, to which through my research has been determined to be double the length of a modern human being, almost triple the length of a modern female. So the red marks on the ground here in front of you is the actual stride <coughs> pattern of the Sasquatch of which these gentlemen measure, which is a 72 inch Step with a 144 inch stride. Right? So I'll just walk it for you and demonstrate it. So this is two of our normal steps, actually two and a half for me. And only two for them. Think about that. That's one of their strides. And that's another one of their strides. So again, double the length of a stride. And almost triple a female. Remember. We're comparing our data against modern science, peer-reviewed, already a published science. We're not making anything up. Triple the average female. The length to width proportion averages, according to Dr. Henan Fehrenbach, 702 prints that he examined, the bell-shaped curve statistically, approximately 
41 to 46 percent length to width ratio. Shorter and fatter, like a baby's foot, as opposed to a baby's foot, as opposed to longer and slender like ours. All right? As we get older, our feet get more slender. The morphology changes. So there's a balance changes. All right? It's important that you remember this percentage. A modern homo sapien is around 33%. Our feet are patterned after long distance runners, marathon runners. These feet are patterned after slow distance mountain dwellers. Morphological difference. In the bone structures and the placement of the weight and centers of gravity. All right, let's talk about the teeth marks. Okay, now we've got tracks, behavioral evidence, prey selection. Location, proximity to water, terrain analysis, little to no scavenger activity, bone stacking, unnatural disarticulation. We've got a mystery here, folks. And the Department of Fish and Wildlife says, mm, somebody did it. Somebody did it. Not some critter. Somebody did it. Okay? These are our average measurements, and these are the bones that we collected from all three sites that exhibited clear and measurable dentition evidence. Okay? If you look at the range and then you compare it with a modern human being from prosthetic dental reconstruction, again, what you're seeing is hominin teeth, not cat teeth, not bear teeth, not canid teeth. Hominin teeth, incisors in this case, that are over double the size in some cases. Then modern humans. Yet similar geometric structure. So we're just looking at size now, okay? Remember, the step and stride length was double, right? Now we're looking at the front teeth marks, double the size. Double. Double. Hominin. Okay? If you look at the same prey, we're looking at deer bones here, elk bones here. They're called cervidae. Hoofed creatures. The most common prey animal selection of all hominins for the last 1,500,000 years is deer and rib elk bones. Stretch them. Deer and rib bones. Deer and elk rib bones, excuse me these types of creatures. And I'll demonstrate that as we move forward in this presentation. So what we're looking at is the prey selection in three different locations that we collected that exhibit teeth marks, what we think are incisor cutouts, front teeth cutouts, that are over double the size in three different independent locations that also had behavioral evidence, bone stacking, which is neotechnology. Track evidence, trace evidence. Prey selection is also behavior. The incisors themselves, this is one of the best examples that we have right here. If you look at, of the 25 measurements, 20 are outside the range. What does that tell us? More than one creature. Them smaller. Maybe three, maybe just two, but definitely a range in sizes. You see what I'm saying? That's another clue. This is elk kill number one, the first rib, and this site is further designated as one rib, one egg, right there. That's how you determine, that's how we charted out each individual mark. So it has a rib designation, it has a location, a hemispherical designation on a specific location on each rib. All right, that's how you break it down. So let's look at the size comparison. Upper canines, right? In graphic form, average is 8.2 millimeters. 
We're looking at 19.05 millimeters in gravity to form the size of the incisor. Over double the size. Still hominin. Okay? Double the size. With 0.5 millimeter worth of average accuracy. So this was an international comparison, not just white guys from Scandinavia. All right, it's important that we broaden our hominin pool for analysis because there's pockets of anomalies. In order to get past that, you need to use international comparisons. The bite radius is the distance between each tooth impression and then compared to the perpendicular distance from the edge of the front of each impression on the bone itself. So in other words, we're just measuring the tooth and correspondingly measuring the notch on the bone itself. And once again, you're looking at what? Almost double the measurement in those years. Okay? By the way, Now, if it has twice as big a teeth, it stands to the reason that the mouth is going to be how big? Twice as big. It has to be, right? Or at least twice as big in order to get those twice as big teeth in there, functionally. All right, so the intercanine distance in this case might be the upper, might be the lower. In this case, it's the upper between the tips of the canine teeth. That enables us to determine the size of the mouth that is hanging on to those very large teeth. And this is his father, in the test case here. This is your average Homo sapien, and this was what we've termed the bone stacker. So once again, how much? Or double, right? Are you starting to see a pattern? Pretty simple. Homo sapien, double the size, double the size leg, stride, step, teeth, mouth size, bite radius. Alright? See a pattern here, correct? Alright. This is where it gets interesting. Dr. Sanford looked at the tooth impressions. They are not ape primate at all. They're not chimpanzee at all. He's the foremost world's authority right now on primate dent tissue. Yeah. Shovel-shaped incisors are quintessentially Neanderthal. Modern human front teeth are like square point shovels. Ancient Neanderthal front teeth are twice as big and they're like round point shovels for tearing out huge chunks of meat out of deer and elk bones and surveyed animals. They had a different diet. As we evolved, and I hate to say that word, as we adapted based on climatology and dietary restrictions, our teeth changed. We got larger back teeth for chewing grains and our front teeth shrunk. Okay? Neanderthal has very specific structures. This is called a lingual tubercle. And what these are, all right, is they're just very robust structures that um, support the large curvature of that tooth. So if you did not have those underlying structures, those teeth would break off much easier. Because what they are is, like I said, square round point shovels are taking huge chunks of meat and bone out. What's interesting is the curvature measurement of those teeth. See that curvature? That's called a radial arc measurement versus a 90 degree, almost a 45 degree angle, 90 degree angle there. And that's somewhere in the middle. These are examples from the University of Arizona's Dental School, uh, looking at curvature examples of Neanderthal here, and modern examples here of primitive Native Americans from about 500 years ago. These are where they're located, and this is actually a Neanderthal dentition fossil here. These are examples from different Neanderthal digs around here with different levels of curvature but all exhibiting the similar structures. Okay. The 
Point A is, is this Neanderthal, is how do we determine and examine individual hominid structures? Teeth. They last longer, they survive in greater numbers, and we can mathematically and geometrically chart the curvature of these teeth because they have very specific characteristics, especially in the case of Neanderthal, which is what we call shovel-shaped incisors. It's a quintessential identification characteristic for that species. Now we think that Neanderthal wasn't directly in line with us, but may have been a species from another bush, like Desinovian. All right? Yet, ancient Native Americans, especially the ones from the far north, all had this tooth structures prior to the last hundred years where they have been hybridized out. In other words, they've been interbreeding with modern European Americans for the last 500 years. And now they have hybridized their teeth to more match modern square point shovels. It's a process that we all go through in the natural kingdom called hybridization. So what we have is not only double the size step and strap, double the size tooth structures that are still common in, double the size mouth, double size bite radius, specific and identifiable, already peer-reviewed morphological characteristics of the teeth. In this case, those creatures had Neanderthal front teeth, not eight front teeth. A relic hominin is a Neanderthal. Remember that, so we're still within those two theories, okay? But we've left the great ape theory behind a long time ago. Modern teeth, Neanderthal teeth, geometric structural difference and size difference. Functional difference. Now let's look at some mathematics. There's one thing to say, oh, it looks kind of curved, right? It looks kind of different. Again, you're looking at graphic representation, excuse me, tooth representation of different examples of curvature. The University of Arizona's Dental School's reconstruction, and you're also looking at our three greatest notch areas with the greatest amount of curvature from all three sites. Because remember, if it's similar organism, it should show similar tooth structures, right? Or it's not. It has to match. Something's wrong. BB1, bone pile number one. You had, here's our comparison right here. You did 0 0.050 millimeters radial curvature. If you look at one of the largest ones that we have, at 0 0.50, just one, again, look at the curvature of that tooth arc. Okay? It is double a modern homo sapien. And all of them are the same, the adults. But guess what we found? Juvenile. Because the curvature was between modern homo sapien and its parents. And there were other clues called mammalons, and we'll discuss those in a second. So now we're looking at these two different creatures. Based upon what? Size of the bite marks on those bones. But they all had a Neanderthal curvature. See that? <clears throat> all the same. Three measurements, all the same. And the baby? Right here, the baby in the middle. Did anybody see those curves? Those are shovel shaped incisors. Does everybody see how sharp that edge is? Rodents chatter. They leave little channels. You can see them. So, not only does it have Neanderthal front teeth, it has double radial arc curvature, including the baby's tooth. Double radial arc curvature. As a modern homo sapien tooth. Period.
Let's look at what rib peeling is. Rib peeling is highly diagnostic of ancient contemporary human beings, hominids. It involves taking hands and snapping off ribs and chewing on the edges to get the connective tissue and meat off. It's been going on for millions of years and it's a quintessentially human hominid homo sapien activity. Not only that, but choosing the ribs from deer and elk are cervidates. So we've got the same animals, the same ribs, and the same processing techniques. They're going to leave ragged edges, fossilized edges, that look exactly the same if they've been peeled. They are. So that was our first clue. The ragged edges match the fossilized record from 1.5 million years ago. There's your first clue. It takes hands, bone peeling, human teeth, in a specific and measurable and predictable process. Okay? Which means that evidence has to be located within that process on those areas of the bone where they've been identified previously. Or it doesn't fit. It has to fit. The fossilized record has to fit our records or it doesn't fit. We're looking for Secondary marks, along with the ragged areas of the bone, they're called double arch and triangle impressions. We're looking for those secondary marks, bone impressions, in specific regions of the bone. Why? More proof. If it's round, it's a lower level primate. Hey. If it's triangular, Hominin, homo sapien, you, 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 all of you, okay? They have double arch structures. It's right where they're supposed to be. These are fossilized bones from 1.5 million years ago. Just like an arch, like a McDonald's arch. There they are, right there. There's your first clue. And you have a double arch structure at the edge of the bone, in exactly the spot hemispherically that it has to be located. Matches. Now what creates double arch? Very simple. You stick a rib in your mouth and you chew it on the side. That's just a mark from the side of your molar. That's all it is. That's the shape from the edge of your molar. It's a double arch. Big deal. It's an impression. That's all it is. It's a cutout. But it takes hands in order to work that bone in that direction, because we have specific teeth structures and jaw morphology, hands. Remember, if it's round, it's an ape. If it's triangular, it's what? Homo sapien, human being. These are triangle impression marks on a raw bone. Punch you and then came back out and closed a little bit. I'll show you ones on the dry bone in a second. There's your first example of a triangle impression right there. There's another one right there. These are the fossilized records here, 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 and here. That is the dental structure that makes the point or the, uh, the punch, as we call it. It is a it's just the bumps on your molars. Cusps, excuse me. Now, there's one right there. Dry one. It matches that one right there from 1.5 million years ago. And where is it? Right where it's supposed to be. On the edges of the bones. So hemispherically, remember it matches the fossilized record, right? Not only is the shape geometrically the same, but it also matches the fossilized record. There's another one right there. Clear, a little farther down. All right. The next identifier is mammalons. 
between 5 to 16 years of age, when we get our new front teeth, they have these little bumps on them to help break through the gum line, it's called mammalons. They come in, I believe, 12, yes, 12 chartable patterns. We were able to chart pattern number eight on several examples of the bones. So in other words, an adult and a juvenile between five and 16 years old was feeding on those bones as well. Because remember some of the sizes, 20 out of the 25 measurements were outside the range, but there was five measurements that were in the range. And now we know why. Because there was another smaller creature chewing on the same remains. That makes two creatures. All right. The analysis comes together as a side-by-side -side comparison of a modern homo sapien human being and what we've determined we call the bone pile, or the trace maker, the bone stack. Look at the height differential. Remember, we can track and chart the height by its step and stride length and its footprint length and width. Your average side of a human, the average height of a homo sapien is 5'9". In this case, it was 8 feet 8 inches tall. The teeth were hominid, the mouth were hominid. The foot size was a different proportion, and a step and stride length was half the distance. Half the distance. Yet still, hominid, hominid, hominid. Human beings quintessentially have engaged in bone peeling activity for 1.25 million years, as evidenced by the fossilized record. We have double arch structures within our adaptive history, within the Neanderthal hominid branch. We've got triangular pressures. Linear scoring is just taking a bone like this and dragging your front teeth down to take connective tissue off. We have, we have examples of both of that, linear scoring and linear scoring. We also have this. Mammalons, shovel incisors, and it takes hands, hands, to snap bones of spinal columns. It takes hands to bone peel. Not pause. Hands. Not my words. Already peer reviewed published science. The same scientists that are reviewing and peer reviewing our work is the ones who wrote these papers. Cutting edge. Cutting edge. All right. This is what we're looking at. You wanted proof. Let's talk science, scientific proof. Rib peeling is a diagnostic signature of hominin mastication. Bottom line. Rib peeling is a diagnostic signature of hominin chewing, period. Takes hands to break them off the rib and spinal columns. Ribs and ungulates in specific are, have always been the target of human beings, homo sapiens, throughout our evolutionary and adaptive histories. And more importantly, it takes prehensile hands to accomplish this activity. Hands. Three different sites. These are the evidence designations. The only thing we can see in, on the first site was triangular impressions. That was it because it's primarily molar work. Bone peeling, double arch structures, triangle impressions, the selection of ungulate species deer and elk, the location, and the fact that the impressions were found on flat bones, they were eaten raw, and it takes hands. So, statistically and mathematically, there's your correlation between all three sites. Right? Not one, three. So you don't have an anomaly, you have consistency, you have a pattern that matches exactly in behavioral and tooth mark evidence. Right? Alright, let's take a look at the proof checklist. Remember, we found footprints. The hybrid hominid theory is the only theory that explains all the data. The great ape theory doesn't explain the dentition data. Dr. Craig Stanford of the University of Los, uh, UCLA says it's not possible. 
Error. The analytical conclusions are accurately situated in peer-reviewed, already published science. I'm not making anything up, people. Every item, behavioral and structural, tooth mark evidence, behavioral evidence, has already been peer-reviewed and published and attributed accurately to what? Homo sapien. Period. Established science. Our evidence is interlocking and mutually supported from all three sites. The behavioral evidence is interlocking and mutual supporting of the teeth mark evidence. It takes hands to chew bones to get teeth mark evidence that is bone peeling, triangle impressions, double arch structures, and mammals. Hands, hands on hands, here. The behavioral evidence, the footprints, and the behavioral evidence matches the processes the homo sapien goes through to taphonically, taphonomically work those bones with his teeth. The data, the tooth structural data, is right there on those bones. It's repeatable. Anybody can examine it and repeat the same measurements. And it's microscopically impossible to fake, period or even reproduced by the same organisms that did it initially because it's a different set of circumstances. Impossible to fake. Repeatable, verifiable, and microscopically impossible to fake or alter under any conditions. Period. What's that called? The very definition of proof. Period. All of the data I have personally <coughs> presented in academic research conferences, subject matter conferences, as well as transmit to over 50 PhDs. Most of them wouldn't even talk to me after that. But the ones that did respond, you gotta go to publication. It's tight, it's airtight, has to be. Amazing claims require extraordinary information, right? Has to be airtight, period. We submitted for the Journal of Archaeological Science, Sciences slash reports, two journals, uh, one of them is established um, uh, archaeological techniques, and the other one is new and cutting edge techniques, and that's where they put our peer review publication processes in the new journal. So that's what we're working on right now. We are still in the peer review process. Like I said, I'm working on the next version right now. It's a multi year process, people. That's the way it works. You have to go through the scientific process, period. And part of that is extremely intensive peer review. And you know they're very unhappy with me. You know why? Because I'm using their research to prove Bigfoot. I never yeah. once mentioned that word, that dirty word, in my paper. Hybrid hominid of some unknown and unclassified variety. I want to give them a door that they can walk through scientifically without ruining their career. Right? Oh, they were upset about that. Really upset. But they couldn't say no because it's tight, it's airtight. And we use their science. I requested the same scientists that published those papers to review our material. Because they were the only ones that were qualified. Right? We want the best. The best. We're still in the hunt. We're still in the hunt. Alright. Everything comes together in the book. All three papers. Uh, my colleagues' um, contributions, <laughs> recognition of their contributions, uh, where this material came from, and how this process evolved from the first paper to the third paper. In addition to that, we've made several other discoveries, including pictographic stones that some of you have seen that depict Bigfoot, in my interpretation, in everyday life. Here's one of them right here, and I'll set this out for you. It matches the Patterson Gimlin film exactly. These are from an archaeological dig about a half hour north of here. You guys can come by and take a look at Please don't touch them. I'll lay them out. My finger juice is the only one I want to get on it, so I'll lay that one out for you so you can see that one. And it actually has some kind of bladed weapon in its hand. So these are connected to a very interesting series of other discoveries as well. Here is a hybrid hominid footprint. Um, expressed in a stone carving that matches 
the materials that you see here, it's right here. And it's actually a stencil made by a three-fingered something. And it came from the same dig as those pictographic stones. And you're, you're welcome to pick that up. It's right there. The interesting part is when this is scaled up exactly 10 times, it matches all of the footprints and the proportionalities that we've been discussing and studying in this class. Of about 43% length to width ratio. So you're looking at 17.5 inches by 7.5 inches by 4.5 inches, scaled up by 10. Within the bell shaped curve average for Henner Fahrenbach, Dr. Henner Fahrenbach's 702 footprint analysis. All right? So not only do we have archaeological evidence, morphological proof, but we have archaeological evidence that backs up the same contemporary evidence that we see. And it demonstrates hybrid hominism, or Morton's foot, as opposed to grade A or relic hominin. We're looking at life cycle from juvenile, and these are gifts by, to me, from Cliff Brackman from the television show Finding Bigfoot. Thank you, by the way. These are taken and found in Michigan to a prime of their life, which is also given to me by Cliff Barackman, which indeed shows a much wider and longer proportionality, but really fat, wide foot. However, it shows, again, hybrid hominism. Morton's foot, the extended second toe. Now we're looking at an elderly one, extended length of the foot and heel. As we get older, our foot lengthens and gets narrower. And once again, you see this expressed in the foot print. And it's expressed in over 90% of all of them. Hybrid toe. Hybrid human hominin sapien toe. Morton's foot. So you're looking at the cycle of life. The cycle of life. And archaeological evidence that all says the exact same thing. Forensic depth of oppression evidence that's been presented at some of the top archaeological research conferences. One of the region's top conferences. This material has been looked at by the Department of Archaeology at the University of Washington and Washington State University. They can't explain it. It's not Native American. We don't even think it might be from this earth. I'm working on that one too. What we're looking at, ladies and gentlemen, is a hybrid hominin. The tooth dental evidence is clear. It's double the size. It's hybrid hominin. It's Neanderthal. The front teeth, the molars, the mammalones, double arch structures, triangle impressions. They're located in the hemispherical regions that they have to be in order to be published and peer-reviewed successfully. All of the evidence is interlocking and mutually supporting. There is nothing that stands out on its own. All of the evidence is mutually supported, verifiable, repeatable, and microscopically impossible to fake. Bones and stones don't lie. This isn't campfire stories. This is hard science. Verifiable, repeatable, and microscopically impossible to fake. Poised to be printed in the world's top archaeological journal. The very definition of proof. Scientific proof. That's the end of this presentation, ladies and gentlemen. Let's take a few minutes, get something to drink, use the restroom, and when we come back, we're going to take a look at what we've been examining over the last eight weeks. I'll answer a few questions, and then I'm gonna give you about a five to six minute closing argument in courtroom style, and then we're going to vote. I'm going to re rediscuss the standards of evidence, answer your questions, and then we'll have a vote. Is there any questions about this presentation? Well, I, I had a thought. What about the bone marrow extraction on these bones? Uh, what would that tell us? Well, 
the what would the organism would be? Well, the energy in there is, you know, I mean, most critters would want the bone marrow. Right. In this case, we actually, I looked at a few of the vertebrae. A lot of the other examples you can see where rodents will attack that and chip the edges off. In this case, I did not see any rodent damage. The bones that I saw, and maybe Aaron saw one in their stack, I did not see any marrow area that had been attacked. There's not a whole lot of marrow in the ribs. You That's the bigger bones. bones. You see it in the bigger bones, and um, we do have a big uh, thigh bone that was sent to us. But anyways, it looks like it was split over a rock and the marrow was dug out. Right. But so again, okay. that makes sense. hands breaking something over a rock, right? So that is a, a, an attractive nutritional uh, source. However, in this case, it looks like these animals were killed and processed uh, in situ or in place. And specifically in my area, there wasn't any hair left. It looked like the animal had been consumed in totality. There was only a few bones that were left, the smaller ones. And there was little to no scavenger damage. There was still red meat attached. And the bone distribution field was conical shaped, which also is indicative of Homo sapien, as opposed to scavenger, <coughs> which is usually haphazard, or in triangular shape, or in elliptical shape. So all of the things that we looked at, and if you start to look into comparative and peer-reviewed science, you start to see patterns emerge. And then, and then you realize that your stuff fits right in there. It just dropped right in there, successfully. And nothing stood out. Nothing was an anomaly, that's what we call an anomaly, that didn't support and didn't mutually interlock with this material. All right? So if you look at our material by itself, it's very conclusive. Like I said, the definition of science. If you look at the totality of all the material that I presented to you in the last eight weeks, well, I'll save that for the closing argument, okay? Any other questions? All right, well, I'm gonna go grab a, a drink of water real quick, and then we will uh, start the closing argument. Before I leave, uh, someone has graciously allowed me to take a look at these shown to our class today. Uh, before you leave here today, uh, I will show you a picture of a Bigfoot, a real one, facial structures. Uh, so when you, anybody says, I've never seen a picture of a Bigfoot, you're like, I have. And the one that you see, the Todd standing one on Netflix, this is a real one. All right? And also, the interesting picture here is, wow. Have you guys all heard about those energy orbs and stuff yeah. that supposedly come down from the sky? Yeah. Uh, would it surprise you if Bigfoot traveled in those? Uh, that would be a stretch. Right? Wouldn't that be a stretch? Yeah, exactly. And you'd definitely need to take a look at something coming down out of the sky, right? With a Bigfoot in it? Something like that? With a figure in it? In one of those orbs? I'll let you guys take a look at these. But yeah, there's a picture of a Bigfoot right there. There's the face, the lips, and the eyes. So, and there it is in black and white, so you can see it a little bit better, eye structures. So, uh, one, of, one of our students, one of our colleagues, who's gracious enough to let these out. So, I will set these over here, and we'll take a look at them a little bit later. So that way you guys can see a face of a real Bigfoot, and you can also see uh, that they might be traveling in these energy orbs, and that is related, I think, to the transportation network that I identified on the stones from the library that I found as well, because it shows orb travel with other organisms in individual ships, similar to what we're looking at here, all right? In different colors, so. That would show a high degree of technological advance. Why would you want to go out and eat raw meat unless you're like a, a predator coming down for a picnic lunch or something? Interesting question. Maybe they get hungry too. If it's a hybrid hominin, we eat. That doesn't mean that we're not from another planet, or it could be from another planet, and then we don't eat. It just means that maybe we're from this planet, but we have access to higher technology. 
Maybe somebody lost it or dropped it or we have it. Or there's, it's unlimited possibilities. But all organisms need nourishment in order to survive, in order to convert energy. All real organisms, even single-celled organisms. So it stands to reason. So let us begin. Uh, <coughs> make sure you sign up for this if you're interested. I'll give you something. It'll be quite interesting, I think, because we have the archaeological crystals, and I had two ships hover over my house last summer, all on videotape, and they're all related to the same phenomenon. So now I'm giving out some more crystals, and we should have some more increased activity because they're signals, beacons. So let us talk about Bigfoot first, and let's wrap this course up. And then we'll take some questions. Eight weeks ago today, today, we sat in this classroom and I showed you a crime scene. Three crime scenes. Murders occurred. Organisms were butchered and killed in catastrophic circumstances. In inexplicable fashion. We have a mystery. And how did we address the mystery? We went and talked to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. We didn't know it was a Bigfoot. Could be anything. He was just curious. They said they couldn't understand what was happening and expressed it was probably homo sapiens, illegal bait or a kill site. I brought out BFRO, Bigfoot Field Research Organization, and they examined the same site. Doctor, not doctor, but Jeff Robinson was their investigator out of Oregon. He came out, surveyed the site, agreed with our assessment, inexplicable. Had Dr. Jeff Meldrum, formerly the world's foremost authority on Bigfoot, formerly, uh, and he assessed our information as well, preliminarily, was unable to determine an opinion, in my opinion. He doesn't have an opinion. Uh, although we did have words at the International Bigfoot Conference uh, related to it, he had the courtesy to come over and take a look at our samples, and so I have to give him credit for that. <clears throat> In addition, he took a look at the syllabuses from the first few classes that we taught at the colleges and consulted. Right? We have a phenomenon that has been occurring for thousands of years. The Native American and the Canadian Amerindians, of which I have demonstrated, are aware of this phenomenon and have been interacting and coexisting with this organism for thousands of years as expressed in their art, their literature, their ethnographies, their cultural traditions to this day. They have stories of interbreeding, of kidnappings, of offspring, successful offspring. We have a phenomenon that's been going on for thousands of years all across the globe that has created physical evidence, genetic evidence, archaeological evidence, and ongoing eyewitness reports and thousands and thousands of casts, as well as other types of information to include archaeological artifacts and forensic and dental impression research, which is impossible to fake. We sat here for eight weeks and examined every piece of relative correction, every piece of reliable documentation. We've assigned validities to it. We've looked at tracks, we've looked at DNA, we've looked at pictures, we've looked at videos. We've looked at bones. We've looked at stones. We've looked at pictographs. I've demonstrated life cycle. and supported that life cycle with forensic dental, independent forensic dental impression research that confirms life cycle, mammalons. We either have an intergenerational, worldwide, global hallucination that's been going on for a thousand years, or there's something out there. Something out there.
I've seen it. You'll see it. The Native Americans know. There's a picture of it right there. Todd standing. Mm -mm. There it is. One of our students got the goods. Where was that taken? Here in Washington. I try not to give out too inf much information on the student because it asks for anonymity. They don't want everybody all over their house. Can you blame them? They have something very special happening. We need to preserve that because it might lead to something amazing. It already has. Right? We're seeing not only this phenomenon, but a second phenomenon that's interlinked. That's for another course. Getting back to this, three crime scenes, all the same. The evidence is clear, microscopically impossible to fake, and available for any scientist at any time, in any place, to examine for free on TV. Because we don't want anybody hiding anything. I've challenged the top scientists in the world to a head-to-head -head debate on TV. Not one of them has taken me up on it. Not one. Not even Dr. Meldrum, who used to be the foremost authority on Bigfoot, in my opinion. Where is it? Where are they? Why aren't they here teaching these classes in universities? Science is death. Three murder scenes. There are no apes in North America. Period. There never has been. But they'd still be here. How did chimps get in South America, you ask? Well, they surely didn't swim across the Pacific or the Atlantic. They came down the land bridge just like everybody else did. But no giant gorillas came down. And if they did, where are they? Bigfoot is not a giant mountain gorilla from the Ice Age. Gigantic is black. Period. Doesn't have the body structure doesn't have the throat structure, doesn't have the foot structure, and his teeth structures are completely different. They're homo sapien. Does it have some mannerisms and potential morphological adaptations or residual uh, examples from its earlier adaptative processes? Absolutely. It's covered in hair. Hello? <laughs> does the hybrid, correction, does the great ape theory explain the data? Only of a small slice. The relic hominid theory, Dr. Meldrum's theory, Paranthropus poisi, Australopithecus, does that explain all of the evidence? No. <coughs> it does not explain the tooth structures. It does not explain its language. Language. What theory explains all of the data? There's only one. Hybrid hominid theory. Bigfoot has been described as having different colored eyes, different colored fur, different activities, some aggressive, some not so aggressive. Engaged in activities with small nuclear families, gathering food sources at different times of the year, Modeling the Native American food gathering strategies. Right? Eating and processing the same types of animals that we have traditionally for the last 1.45 million years. All published in accurate review and peer review world class journals. The information that we provided you over the last eight weeks not only demonstrates the reality of an organism that's real. It's leaving data, verifiable data from many different sources, including pictures, morphological representations or trace documents, 
archaeological artifacts, and they all say the same thing. Hybrid hominin was Morton's toe. Congenital human defect. Human. That's right. Human. Homo sapien. So, not only does it exist worldwide in different variations and forms, just like we do. Take a look around the room. Different colored hair, different eyes, some with no hair, some with hair. Different body structures, different foot, different eye colors. Yet we are all the same. Homo sapiens, human beings, involved in adaptative process. Because evolution, in my professional opinion, is not possible. There's too many genetic bookends. Or we would continue to see evolution today. And we don't see it. It didn't just stop. Okay, we got it right. That's it. We're good. No. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. What we have is an organism that's homo sapien. And that's my classification. The name classification is homo sapien. It's very, very close to us. So close that it's been able to successfully exchange genetic materials in the form of interbreeding episodes as documented by Native Americans. And the evidence which you see expressed in graphic format. And the last interaction that this organism had was with archaic Native Americans. And that's how it got the front teeth. Neanderthal front teeth. Because that's the last genetic exchange that this organism's line had. And it picked up a genetic snapshot. A residual evidence of that genetic material exchange. That's why it's so intelligent. That's why it has its own language. That's why it has its own structures, its own family units, its own culture, its own migratory routes. That's why it's so intelligent. But it has one weakness. Only one weakness. The same one you have. Curiosity. They're very curious about us. And we're very curious about them, as evidenced by your participation in this course. I have demonstrated from the foot to the head that not only does this organism exist, but it exists successfully in large numbers worldwide. And how did it get there? The same way we did, it walked. It walked. It models the same food gathering strategies as ancient Native Americans. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you in this court today that not only have I proved that this organism is a corporal, real creature beyond any reasonable doubt, beyond any doubt at all. But more so that it's us. It's one of us. It's had a parallel evolutionary development that has intersected with us over many generations, as evidenced by the Native American and Amerindian ethnographies. And the genetics as expressed in its foot morphology. We're not making this up. You would not see this if it was an intergenerational, global-wide hallucination that's been going on a thousand years. You wouldn't see any of this. None of it. Bones and stones. You want to discount everything? Fine. You want to discount Dr. Ketchum's DNA analysis? Hybrid hominin. Fine. You want to discount Dr. Henning Farenbach? Fine. Dr. Melton, the foremost, world's foremost authority in the world? That's okay too with me. But you can't discount bones and stones. Why does the genetics keep coming back and potentially contaminated? Because of homo sapiens. 
ให้ประชาชน
If it was a simple ape, we'd have bagged it already. If it was a simple human being, we'd have bagged it already. I guarantee it. I would have bagged it for sure. But it's not. There's something else going on. Not only are they perfect in the bush, but they have access to some kind of technology, as demonstrated by my archaeological artifacts and one of our colleagues' information. Do we need to kill something to prove it? I say ethically we don't. Right? Classical science says yes. That we have to have a type specimen in order for comparison purposes. I understand that. I suggest to you that we already have a type specimen. It's you. And you and you. And all of you. And there it is. Here is our type specimen right here. A modern human being. We don't have to kill one of these to get a type specimen. We kill each other every day. There's lots of dead bodies laying around, especially in Chicago. <laughs> and if you compare it side by side, now you understand what we're looking at. We're looking at us. 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 I hope all of you join me on the field trip. It may or may not be an interesting experience. It's not up to me. It's a wild end. It has its own agenda. But I know this, they know me. And they know that my calling strategy, when I bring them down, you'll see them. You'll see their red eyes ring the tops of the cliffs and you'll see them. And you'll, more than that, you'll feel it. Your whole body will shake. You will vibrate. Then they come down. And you feel it. The proximity. I'll point them out. They can't hide their eyes. And I've got an infrared body tracking device I use for down pilots. I'll tell you exactly where they are. You can see them moving around. It's a little shimmer. And you can still see their eyes. And then they'll, rah, and then they'll throw a log over something. Let you know they're really there. No one has ever been hurt. I've never had anybody accosted, um, threatened, uh, body slammed. I uh, had a couple rock and roll bands over there last summer, and one of the guys was had his this like long like crocodile Dundee knife, right? And they were screaming at us and throwing logs over at us and hitting us with rocks. And next thing you know, he he grabs his knife like you know he's Ranger Rick, and guess what happened? Something hit him on the hand with a rock. And guess what he did? He started screaming and ran off. <laughs> then he realized there was nowhere to go. So he turned around about 20 feet and come screaming back. <coughs> Point being is this. It's an educational experience. Never had any problems whatsoever. And it's a welcome time. There's no hiking, no nothing. I meet you there at the end of the lake. Come out and jump in the back of my truck at the parking lot in my campsite. I take you out to this quarry, I call them down, and then I send you out in small groups where I'll drop you off in certain areas on the route back. There's only one way in and one way out, you can't get lost. I'll pick you up in a couple hours and uh, <coughs> then uh, we'll toss it on us. What happened? What happened? Did anything happen? What'd you see? What'd you feel? Okay, because a lot of it is not just something like sneaking up on you with red eyes and barking at you, all right? A lot of times you'll get weird messages in your head or you'll feel stuff or you'll see atmospheric disturbances, or there'll be unexplicable things happening, like the air shimmers, or you'll see a little baby chimpanzee run across the road right in front of you. What looks like a baby chimpanzee. First time I saw that, I felt really weird. I looked around and something just dropped on all fours and scurried across the road. It didn't bound, it scurried. First time I was there with Jeff Robinson from BFRO, one of them came out of the woods, and it was huge. I mean, huge. Jeff Robinson is six foot nine. He walked right up to it and it was dwarfed. You could see its eyes. I was from here to you, man. Got my pistol like this. And guess what happened? 
its eyes dilated, like this, its pupils, like a cat. <coughs> so it went, and it's like, the only way I can describe it is like a, a flashlight, army flashlight with a red filter that's going dim. So you kind of see it, right? That's exactly what I said. Whoa. <laughs> it was real. I wasn't hallucinating. And that's exactly what I said to myself. I'm not hallucinating. This is real. I've got a picture of a red Bigfoot at Bigfoot City. I think it's on this computer, actually. Uh, it doesn't look like that one. It looks more like an orangutan looking thing. It was a more finer looking features. Again, hybrid hominid. In closing, before we vote, and all of you are welcome, guests today vote too. If we have a hallucination or a cultural affiliation, okay, a shared hallucination common experience, it happens. UFOs are not real, right? So we're all hallucinating worldwide. But we've all hallucinated the same experience, right? Common experience. You would not have that with accompanying physical information, physical data. Okay? You'd have the stories, you'd have the carvings, you'd have the legends, but you wouldn't have physical data that's not only being repeated contemporaneously, but historical. We have archaeological data, we have bones and stones. You wouldn't have any of that if it was a hoax or hallucination. You'd have stories and legends and cultures and artistic representations, that's it. But you wouldn't have teeth marks on bones from 2013 and 14. Which means it's still alive, it's still eating, and it's taking care of its business right today. All right, any questions before we vote? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Do you take your dogs with you when you go out and do Yes, I do. How Some do people. Uh, sometimes they have been oblivious, and other times they've been shaken so much and tried to get into my sleeping bag. So it's really about, I think, the personality of the organism that's doing the interaction. I've had ones up at Ryan Lake that are extremely aggressive, screaming at me, throwing big stumps, and just generally carrying on all night long. Uh, and I've had other ones that uh, just look at me and don't do nothing, just look. I went to the Yakima Indian Reservation. Not many people know this. As a guest of one of the elders, they interact with these creatures and have been for thousands of years. They trade. Trade with them. Hides, meat, pelts. To this day, Yakima Indian Nation have a long history. Any other questions about any of them? Yes, sir. Your uh, first discovery, your bulk stack, yes. was like the end of May? Um, it was in actually, after the snows, we're looking at April, May. Okay. Aaron, was was your discovery around the same time? Uh, yeah. Like year, like like late spring? It was, um, it was the following year. The first one was sometime in the spring. Right, because they brought me out uh, in October to survey the sites. I mean, during both, okay, so fall and spring, during both those times, isn't that typically a uh, time of the year where there's a lot of movement with elk and deer? Yeah. A lot of movement and uh, calving, breeding. Um, also, there's a lot of hunters, okay? So one of the things I did in the first paper was look at what the hunting seasons were in what regional game management areas to see if the time frame that we identified these bones, because they went through a degeneration process. Okay, bones through go a process themselves in the forest as they degenerate. We were able to fix that process to be within the first series, I think it's called Beekus Laws um, scale. And it was one to five, and, but we have still had fresh meat attached and the uh, cortical integrity of the bones was still almost fresh and they still maintain some elasticity. So we're looking at within three to six weeks, roughly, uh, depending on the conditions of the weather, 
from the time they were deposited to the time they were recovered on the first two. I'm not sure about the second one. But you can tell the way the bones begin to break down how old they are. The second one was pretty fresh. Fresher than the first one. It still had red meat on it. Yeah. Uh, the first one is here. That region is usually locked in and caves and it's still around right. now. So once again, we had to fix the lock gates and the hunting seasons for those game management areas to rule out legitimate hunters. But it might have been a few months old. So. Exactly. So a lot of that depends on the climate, okay? How fast these bones melt. If the bones didn't disintegrate, you'd be walking on a carpet of bones 10 feet deep, right? Because of all the animals that have died underneath your feet for the last 10,000 years. There'd be, there'd be 10, 10 feet of bones high everywhere. Or the scavenging kit, which tells you that these were marked with some kind of olfactory substance like urine. And that the animals in that ecosystem knew exactly what it was. And that's why they didn't process those bones. Well, the animal gives up a free meal in the bush. Only one that knows it's going to die if it gets too close. Because instinctually, it's aware of that organism based on its urine smell. Now, the Department of Fish and Wildlife always also says that no animal, no scavenger is going to shy away from human urine. Interesting. That they know of. No animal will shy away. No scavenger will shy away from what they think is modern human urine. So if you went and killed some animal and then you did your business around it, it would not um, deter the scavengers from that ecosystem, according to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. But in this case, it did. Well, I, I, maybe they just didn't want to walk on the trail, but I've heard differently. And I camped out at West Lacher National Park one time with another friend on spring break and a couple of gals. And we went down onto a little peninsula that went out onto the lake. And George and I just pissed all over that trailhead sure. where we went to sleep. And the grizzlies walked right that night. I could hear them. They walked, they, so they avoided, they, they knew you were there. They that trailhead that yeah. night. I could hear them. The next morning, I got up early, went out, walked around, saw the crap laying all over the place. And they never bothered us. Yeah. And they had killed a couple of people there earlier the, the previous year. Right. Um, in that case, I would say generally a bear is a hunter, not necessarily a rodent scavenger. So I have to look into that a little bit further. But I would say, according to the current research, and here in the Pacific Northwest, and as affirmed by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the resident scavengers, meaning rodents, porcupines, things like that, ferrets, uh, according to them, uh, avoid those areas. Uh, how do you test that? I don't know. Well, you go out and kill something and pee around it and then set up some gale cameras, some game cameras, and see if, if you know they're going to avoid it. That would probably be the only way you could do it, really, I think. Uh, but I'm open. Um, I'm open to all possibilities. Well, I know animals do mark their territory with the urine. Cougars will. Sure. And, you know, cougars, most animals will stay away from their scent. Uh, maybe not all, but most of them will. Right. Uh, difference between, like, say, a predator and a scavenger. I mean, predators mark their territory, and all the prey animals probably are aware of that, uh, aware of that, that flavor. Uh, any other questions before we vote? All right. It's that time. Very simply, the standard of evidence is as follows. Oh, beyond a reasonable doubt is the most important standard of evidence in any criminal trial. It sends people to prison for the rest of their lives in a gas chamber. All right? That's the bar I set for this course, beyond a reasonable doubt, any reasonable doubt. Now remember, reasonable doubt does not mean that there's no doubt. Okay? I don't have a Sasquatch saying, I did it. I've got everything else. Reasonable doubt means there is doubt. But in this case, it's not reasonable. <coughs> you can't say it's not this because of that. 
It can't be a homo sapien because I just don't think it is. I just don't believe it. All right, that's not what we're here to do. We're here to make a decision based on the evidence presented in this course. Okay? Is the evidence that was presented in this course, did it prove beyond any reasonable doubt that one, it's not a hoax or a hallucination? I don't have a vote, but I say, I did. I proved it. And I knocked it down in bones and stones, so let's vote. Everybody that says, I proved it, raise your hand. All right. Who's on the fence? One on the fence. Who says no? What do you say, sir? On the fence? On the fence. On the fence. Two on the fences. Okay. So we have proven that it's not a hoax. By preponderance of the votes in this republic, democracy based republic. So, of the three main origination theories, who thinks it's a great idea? Anybody? All right. Who thinks, and the high, the relic hominin is very specific. Okay, he doesn't, he doesn't frame it that way, but I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. It is a relic hominin that's a Paranthropus voici or an Australopithecus that's much smaller, that's based on the cranial structure and potential sagittal crest or pointed head. That's it. It's not big enough, it doesn't have the structures, it doesn't have the brain cavity, it doesn't have the tooth structures, any of it. It's all based on sagittal crest. Who here thinks that the relic hominid theory, as well, as framed generally by Dr. Meldrum, explains all of the data? Who said that? Anybody? Anybody says that Dr. Meldrum's theory is complete and comprehensively explains all the data? Anybody? Me either. All right. That means there's only one theory left. If a theory explains all of the data without anomaly, it explains the primate theory because the relic hominid theory includes the primate theory and the hybrid hominid theory includes the relic hominid theory and the primate theory too because hybridism is ongoing. Is there any proof that we evolved from apes? No. Is there any proofs that apes evolved from chimps or vice versa that we evolved from chimps? No. There's some genetic material that we share, but that's it. There's no link fossils. There's no nothing. We have more that links us with this unknown, supposedly unclassified organism than what classical science says you came from. The toes don't lie. Human. Baby, life cycle. If you look at apes, they look the same. You look at all chimpanzees, small variations, but they all look the same. If you look around the room, we're all the same, but we don't look the same. We don't act the same. And we don't eat the same foods. We all like different things. And we all have different cultures, different customs. Why? That's a very good question. Why are we so different than any other organism on this planet? That's a very good question. Why don't we have any close relatives? That's a very good question. Why is our closest relative being totally ignored? That's a really good question. Who thinks that the hybrid hominin theory, as expressed, explains all of it? I do. Is there anybody else who thinks that there's anything outside of the data? If you do, speak up, because I'd be happy to address it. All right? This is important. When you leave here, you remember only two or three things. I did a great job. Number one, <laughs> for your evaluations. If you haven't filled them out or haven't got them, let me know. I'll make sure you get one. Um, secondly, that it is real. Anybody who ever told you 
you're a liar if you saw one, or that you're hallucinating, or that you didn't see it, they're wrong. It's real. I've seen it. I'll show it to you. You were right, and they were wrong. They've never been right. Science has never been right. That's why it's constantly evolving and, and rechecking and looking and, and then correcting themselves. It's a self-correcting system. That's the way it's supposed to work. New information comes out, you evolve. Correction, adapt. You adapt your theory as the evidence comes out. And once the theory no longer explains the evidence, you abandon that theory because it doesn't work anymore. And you continue to bring in data. That's what science is supposed to do. But that's what they fail to do these days because they're stuck in these little silos of academics. And if you don't, if you're not classically, you know, uh, educated within that specific sphere of science, then if you can't possibly know anything. Because I'm an expert, right? Although I don't see outside my ivory tower. And that's another reason why this has not been solved, is because the disciplines that are needed to solve this, like medicine, archaeology, climatology, primatology, anthropology, zoo archaeology, forensic dental impression research, genetics, those are all individual high-level disciplines. And if you can't connect the dots, then you're looking at things in isolation. And it's easy to say, well, that, no, maybe, impossible. But if you look at it all together, the totality of it, and the validity of the stones and bones, then you have no choice for any honest, self-respecting person, I say that far, to accept that there is something out there that is closely related to us, and that there's other things out there that we have yet to discover. All right? And I hope all of you got a chance to take a look at that picture. You saw it? Do you see it now? The face? All right. So, now you know, that's just one face. I've seen other faces that look finer featured, more dog looking. I've seen one that look more cat looking. They had amber eyes. Again, proof of hybridization. Adaptation. Do you ever wear like a body cam or something like that where you could actually take these pictures? I don't wear any technology. I found that the more technology that I brought out, the less activity I got. So what I, the only thing I bring out now is just my little infrared thing. So I can locate them so I know I'm not hallucinating. So when I see red lights and things snapping and stuff, I'm like, okay, I'm not tripping. There's the heat signature. And then I'll walk right up to it and I'll just kind of make myself available. You know what I mean? And it really depends on how they want to react, you know what I'm saying, with you. And so I just make myself available and I do something curious. Like we usually play cowboy poker, me and my cousin. We get in the middle of the night and we'll sit there with red headlights on. And we'll play uh, cribbage on a little portable table. And we'll drink a beer or something. And they'll get, we'll ignore them. And they'll get so close to where they're like wondering why you're not acknowledging them. And they'll be on all fours around your feet. Wondering why you're ignoring them. Instead of doing this, did you hear that? Did you see that? Just ignore them. Then they get closer and closer and closer. They're doing a threat assessment. They want to know if you got a gun. Leave the technology home. If you want an experience, let these people play these games. We're, we're students. I'm educated. We don't need this stuff. We go there to experience and study. Right? We're not trying to prove anything. We've already proved it. Nobody will accept it. Nobody believes me. I'm crazy. It's okay. But I want you to see it. So you know in your own heart that not only do what you see is accurate, it's been scientifically analyzed, but when you see it in the forest, you'll be like, okay, I expect to see something. That wasn't a bear. Um, oh, my God. So this field trip, what's its time frame? Um, I'm looking at like uh, the third week of this month. Oh. I want to get there before the 4th of July because that's when all the city slicking folks come in from all the cities and it ruins everything. They fish out everything and there's millions of people all over the forest and they go back higher up in the mountains. Okay, but I mean also the time of day. Is it like an overnight camp out? Uh, I'll be there two or three days. I recommend that people get there in the evening um, if you're going to do an overnight. 
will uh, we'll meet about 8. Um, I'll give a briefing about 10, 11 o'clock right in there. I load everybody up in the back of my truck. I take you up to the quarry. We call them down. Uh, people can walk from there. Some people can stay back at the camp. And then I can set people up in different areas. And then I'll go back and to the main camp, make sure that person didn't get kidnapped. And then I will be back to pick everybody up like three, four hours later, about an hour before dawn. We'll go back to the main camp and we'll have a conversation. Uh, you guys are welcome to take off whenever, obviously. Uh, but uh, I'm interested to find out if anybody had any experiences. And what was it? Uh, did you see something? Did you hear something? Uh, some people from the last trip last year, they did not think that they saw anything, but they got weird messages. <coughs> Mental messages. One of the guys came up to me was kind of embarrassed. I'm like, what? He goes, I kept getting these weird voices in my head, asking me what my name was and why I was here, and what did I want. I'm like, I've heard that before. I had another guy get knocked out right in front of me with what's called a, I don't call it an EMP, but a low level sonic thump or something. I'm sitting there talking to this guy, and next thing I know, his eyes roll back and he passed out. And he and I called him before he hit his head on a rock, and I woke him up and like, well, where were you at? He goes, what do you mean? I go, you just passed out. And there was three other witnesses. <laughs> you just passed out. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, we're sitting on the ground. So it's happened to me before, too. Only I got uh, nauseous. And other people have documented that some kind of subsonic 17 decibel or below. Tigers use it. Lions used to stun their prey. We think Bigfoot might use to stun animals, and then you can just snap them necks or grab them by the back leg and break it. It's a sonic thump. It's all this. Crocodiles, hippos use it, too. You can feel it in your body. Some people, it just made me nauseous. So, uh, other types of activity. I'm not sure if that's some kind of adaptation or, I know the US government uses it as a crowd control weapon as well. Uh, so, uh, which leads us to advanced technology. All right, so we've only scratched the surface of this. Oh, here. not if it's mental. Or mental. And that's what my brother thinks. He thinks it's old school shamanism, Native American shamanism. My, my brother, he's big time native. Uh, I'm okay with that because I get weird messages too in the forest. But I'm a scientist, so if we can't document it and prove it and, and present it in academics, then I'm probably not going to deal with it. Unless I got, we have pictures and stones and bones and those kinds of things, all right? So the next step is dialing down where they're getting their technology from and how are they using it. And is there a connection between Bigfoot and UFOs? And if so, how do we explain uh, the students' pictures of some kind of shape coming down in an uh, energy orb that looks like a human figure? Uh, I, I see it's almost beyond me, you see, to contemplate these kinds of realities, uh, but knowing that it's true. And that once again, and I'll say it again, with Charles Hapgood uh, in 66, if you want to find these things, you need but look. Open your eyes and see. That's it. And that's what I want to leave you guys with in the course, is I very much appreciate all of you coming out uh, online as well uh, and supporting the college. Uh, these are all controversial classes that I teach, and they get a lot of pushback uh, from the community and. Uh, the past uh, present. I got some heavy pushback on some of my earlier classes because of it. And I appreciate you taking the time to support continuing education. It's important. And that's why I volunteer to teach all of these classes is I enjoy it. And I want all of you to understand that the world is so much bigger than what you read on TV or what you read in the paper or what you see on Facebook. And if you want to discover it, all you have to do is Open your eyes and see the world as it really is, not as they tell you it is. Right? Because there's so much more out there. <coughs> not only ancient societies and mysteries and Bigfoot and extraterrestrials and Loch Ness Monster, all of those things, those are all available for all of us to look into. All we have to do is re-engage our minds. And that's what continuing education is all about. 
right? It's for the community to re-engage yourselves in learning, all right? And hopefully add richest, richness and color and texture to your lives by being able to have something new, something interesting. And that's why they bring in instructors like myself in order to give you cutting edge information about controversial subjects. And it's as simple as that. So once again, thank you very much. I very much appreciate all of you. And our guests, thank you very much for coming today. I very much appreciate it. Thanks to again. Thank you. Uh, feel free to look at this stuff. Uh, like I said, um, and I'm just going to pack up my stuff here in a few minutes and be on my way. So uh, let's see. I've got some business cards here if you want one of my cards. And uh, make sure you're interested in that field trip. Uh, take a look, put your name down, your phone number. And I will let everybody know what it is. Like I said, real casual. I'm just going to drive over there. Um, most people will just come that night. I'll call them in. You'll do your thing. And then you can be on your way. And if I know the usual, you're gonna all going to have a really wild experience. At minimum. At minimum, you'll hear the screaming and the big logs getting pushed over. And the tree knocks and the rock clacks and all of this stuff. And that's why I like to get over when nobody else is there because... We don't simulate anything. We don't uh, try to call them in with simulating their stuff because we don't want any confusion between them and us. I'll tell you what I use. I use a conch shell from Hawaii. And I get up on the mountaintop, and it goes 20 miles across. And they, that's my signature call. Who else can use a Hawaiian conch shell and just cascade? Next thing you know, whoo, they're there. I used to use a distressed elk call. And I had them coming in hot for a free meal. And that freaked people out because they came in ready to kill. And they were very aggressive. You see what I'm saying? And I'm like, oh, wait a second. We don't need that. And then I just transferred over to the conch shell. And they know exactly what's going on. Students, they'll bring their families. You'll see babies too. Any other questions? Before I pack my stuff up and head back to my books and my computers. Oh, one last class. I'm teaching one more class. Uh, last class in college. Uh, that's the old one. It's a democracy. Uh, home rule charter. We're having this big election here and we're uh, rewriting the constitution for Lewis County. Uh, Lewis County is the oldest and largest and arguably the most dysfunctional county in the entire state. And it's time I helped write the budget last fall uh, on the Citizen Budget Advisory Committee for the county. It's time that we rewrote the constitution and brought back citizen oversight uh, to what, in my opinion, is an out-of-control county government. And part of that is, rather than stand for elections and dominate the process, uh, the college asked me to teach a class and certify uh, the participants in Home Rule Charter, uh, Democracy in Action. So I have several people have already signed up that are already uh, candidates for freeholders' positions, and they're going to be elected to rewrite that constitution. Uh, it's an eight-hour uh, correction, two, four, six, eight, ten-hour course. Eight-hour course. And we'll do the same thing basically Saturdays. We're going to talk about small group leadership, communications, uh, building and archiving formal documents. And then the last two sessions, we're going to sit down and we're going to write a constitution. We're going to sit down and I'm going to divide everybody up and we're going to write a constitution for Lewis County in real time. And that way the candidates... When they write in their constitution, in reality, they've already been through the process. They know what to do. All right? So that's on July 21st, 28th? Yes, and those are Saturdays. There's a misprint on the time frames. Those are Saturdays. And um, if you register, talk to the person you register with and you give the exact time. I'm pretty sure it's 11 to 1 on Saturdays on those dates. The first two sessions, like I said, will be leadership, communications, and document construction archiving. The last two sessions, we're going to sit down and we're going to build a constitution. We're going to build a framework, and that way when these people get elected, and if you approve the process, they'll hit the ground running. The, the, the article says the history of home charter. Absolutely. That's going to be the first part of it. The first lecture will be the history of it. We've got to give you context of how it's been used in Washington State and the United States to tell you what it, home rule charter is, how it's worked, here in Washington and in the country. How it's working currently. Once we can examine what Home Rule Charter is, how it's working, the history of it, 
Then we'll talk about how do you make it. We have to be able to communicate in small groups. We have to be able to uh, honor each other's thoughts and opinions. We have to be able to construct a document and archive it because it's a constitution, right? So we need a record of creating this document. And then we need to create the document, right? And there's a leadership vision involved there and a philosophy. Do you believe in big government? Do you believe in citizen-inspired government? Do you believe in socialism or even Republican democracy? Okay, so the first thing we need to establish is the leadership vision of where this county should be in 20 years from now. What, what, what does that look like? How do we as citizens manage that growth the way we want it? Not the way they want it. Because they've already failed. The way we want it. And how do we institutionally write that into our constitution to make sure that's in law? And then we have citizens advisory committee that has veto power over the county commissioners. Imagine that. Think about that. Well, if you had power over the county commissioners as a citizens group. <coughs> well, yeah, right. Uh, I was telling you about that citizen group I was involved with a little bit ago, but like, right. Yeah, you know, Lewis County is the only Greenbelt south of Olympia and north of, uh, or you know, south of Seattle and north of Portland. You know, from here to Olympia and from Chehalis to Longview. Right. And everything else on the I-5 corridor, unless you get north of Seattle, is, in, is industrialized. Here it is right here, you guys. Yes. So that's and something, you know, we need to really look at preserving. Well, Clark County has it set up. Exactly. You know, so in comparison. It can work. It is also floodplain. We have well, challenges, institutional and structural challenges in this county, and we have had, and we also have geographic separation between East County and West County, okay, which is a different mentality. So we have functional challenges here and structural challenges and systemic challenges, not only in our structures, but how we organize our revenue collection. Homeowners get the majority of the tax burden in this county, not business owners, because we don't have enough investment. Another thing would be if we could subdivide to less than five acres in unincorporated Lewis County, that would double the tax revenue in this county alone and allow all of us to develop our land. Less taxes. There's a lot of things that we could be doing that they just don't understand, they don't have the leadership vision for. That's all it is. They don't know. And part of that procedure is to develop that understanding without limitations of what can be. There's no limitations on, on this process. You can do whatever you want. You can write whatever you want. It's your county. Take charge. Build a government you want. This is a unique opportunity that's come around once in 150 years to be involved in this process of drafting your future in this county. People that get involved are going to have a unique opportunity to build a constitution that might be a model, a repeatable model of excellence for other communities in this country to regain control of their government. That's why I teach that class. That's the one class that I'm teaching love before I sell all my stuff and move to the Caribbean. And they got a little big foot down there in Belize, a little foot. So hopefully we'll find one of those. A little foot. I think it's gonna be a little harder to find because it's all jungle and he's a little small. But remember, they got one weakness, what is it? Curiosity. That's right. Thank you very much, everyone. I very much appreciate your time. Hope to see some of you in the class. Thank you very much. So the time is on in this booklet. Yeah. No, uh, it's going to be on Saturdays again, and it'll be generally public from 11 to 1. If you call and register, they have the exact information. Thank you very much. Yes. I'm so one glad you Thank you very much for everything. I'm glad you came. Yeah. It's good to see you. Yeah. Um, I'll pop in on occasion. I will pop in on occasion.